Okay, so this is the third and final part of this uh, masterclass, um, and it will really be around you know working together in terms of public health agencies and MET services um, and how you might actually uh, work towards setting a um, operational threshold. So to cover this, um, first of all, we'll um, discuss you know, potential ways of working. Um, and as highlighted in the first lecture, partnerships is one of the key um, key things to, to these warning systems. Um, and then we'll move into uh, the thresholds. So, um, you know, how you might work towards setting those. Um, so, you know, thinking about what type of system should be used, um, what data metrics should you use, and finally, um, you know, it, it's really all about consensus. Um, and then we will have some examples. So we'll have an example from Argentina and then an example from uh, England. And then we'll finish off with um, just a, a consideration really about how these warning systems actually fit um, into heat health action plans in general. Because um, I think it's, it's important to remember um, that these systems are actually part of these heat health action plans. So what kind of partnership is, is required? Um, and this is really a vital question and, and may, may depend on a number of different factors. Um, but I'll just give some examples. Um, so the first one is a commissioner-operator relationship. Um, so a good example of this is the English Heat Health Watch alert system. Um, and this system is commissioned by Public Health England and operated by the UK Met Office. Um, so this is for both heat and cold um, weather warnings. A another example is co-ownership. Um, so a, a very good example of this is between the UK Met Office and the Environment Agency. Um, both organizations staff this flood forecasting center. Um, so this allows both organizations to effectively own the narrative of, of flood risk. Um, so this really ensures that um, the risk of different messages going out is, is reduced to, to almost nothing. Um, and, you know, the, the Flood Forecasting Center is also another example of another way of working, and that's actually the owner and user. Um, so in, this, in, in that instance, Public Health England use the output from the Flood Forecasting Center um, to, to guide the public health response to any flood risk um, that is, is identified within uh, this system. But then there are you know, wider relationships um, uh, with you know, other organizations and other departments. Um, and in England, you know, there's uh, a good example of this is the Natural Hazards Partnership. Um, so this is really a wide array of organizations and research bodies that uh, work together um, to deliver a, a coordinated assessment of, of natural hazards on a daily basis. So while all of these organizations may not be um, working together on every single aspect of hazard warning, um, they come together in this partnership um, to ensure that where possible they are linked in and joined up and, and consistent. Um, I think it's it's worth mentioning that um, it's not just in it, you know there's there's examples outside of the UK as well and um, I know that uh, Carolina um, had shared um, with us previously some examples of of that in in Argentina. So we'll move now into some um, things to think about um, when actually moving towards setting. Uh, thresholds for action. So there are a number of um, factors which which may dictate which type of warning system is most suitable and that will primarily be around what data is available and what analysis has, has been undertaken. 
Um, there are, of course, in addition, other factors uh, which relate to data availability um, that will be vital um, to consider. So examples of this are you know, the spatial and temporal resolution of the data. Um, and this links us back to some of the data considerations um, that we outlined in lecture two. Um, also, you know, how current is, is the data? So using data from, say, 20 years ago may not actually be a true reflection of the temperature health impact relationship as it is now. Um, and then there's also operational um, aspects such as, you know, how do you process the information in the right times and what are the systems, um, system requirements and, you know, um, sort of those, those type of things. And I thought at this point it might be um, a good opportunity to address one of the common questions that uh, came up um, from the registration um, process, and that is how how would you set appropriate heat alert thresholds where there um, there are no heat related mortality or morbidity data available? And I suppose. If, if all you have is, is met data, then you know, that may be all you have to work with. Um, so we saw the full spectrum of warning system types in, in lecture one, and uh, we went through the appropriateness of, of those um, systems depending on data, availabil data availability, and then sort of what they cover in terms of the exposure, vulnerability, and um, so you know, ultimately, whatever type of system you, you go for it will depend on the data that, that is available and, and what is going to be um, or will have the most, will, will be the most of the most benefit um, to elicit action. So I think a key point at this point, uh, at, at this stage, is, is just to, to think that you, know, you don't need an all bells and whistles type of system if it doesn't really add anything to your response. And if a simple threshold based on the climatology for a region alone does the job, or at least is a starting point, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't start there and then move forward as and when you can, and if it's useful to do, do so. So in other words, if you only have climate data to work with, then you know, perhaps you should start there. Um, but you know, working with health colleagues or other um, organizations to actually set up um, system structures to, to allow data capture um, so that a as you move forward you have that data available and you know that's all part of um, developing health surveillance systems and um, building healthcare systems in general so it becomes a wider issue um, but if, if all you have is met data then it's probably a good place to start So where you set any threshold will, will depend largely on risk, um, on, on what risk is deemed tolerable or acceptable, but also consider, you know, where, what temperatures that risk actually equates to. So for example, with this, this is the temperature mortality relationship um, for London, I believe. Um, if we were to set, say, a relative risk of 1.1, 1 .1, which is a 10% increase in risk of mortality, is this tolerable or is it too high? And also, does that temperature at which we would be issuing an alert um, make sense? So that is what, maybe 27 degrees? You know, is, is, would that be too low a temperature? Or what if we were to think, okay, well, 10% increase in mortality is, is too high. Okay, but what about 5%? So that's what that equates to, and the temperature that might equate to is you know, below 25 degrees. Okay, well, what about one, a 20% increase? And that equates to about 30, just over 30 degrees. So there's, there's no really correct answer to this question, but um, you know, it comes down to professional judgment and, and really consensus. Um, you know, it's you need to take a, a balanced and pragmatic view or, and, and using the epidemiology and the climatology to help in, in making decisions. And, and that really brings us to the next slide, which is, you know, it's 
it's it's really about um, consensus. And you know, this this masterclass has been about the principles behind how you might set an operational threshold threshold rather than hard and fast rules. Um, but I think one of the key messages throughout this has been consensus. Um, so here um, I've listed uh, different um, sort of individuals or organizations that should probably be involved in this. So we have health, uh, public health practitioners and experts, so they um, should understand the data and the operational needs of the health and social care sector. And, 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 you know, be aware of those potential pinch points that may occur um, and how other sectors may interact or intersect with health and well-being. Um, and they should be able to guide on the utility of, of any warning um, and the appropriateness of, of any threshold. Um, the MET services obviously provide um, the meteorological expertise, both in forecasting um, and the climatological outlook and, and parameters, but also um, experience in setting up these uh, weather warning systems um, in the first place. Um, you know, it's, it's also vital that we have academic experts involved here because they, they understand the underlying science and the methods and, and the data uh, on which thresholds could be based. Um, you know, there, there are other sectors that probably need to be um, involved because, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that all other sectors will not have some kind of role to play when a warning is issued. Um, so, you know, an, an, an example of this is local government. Um, you know, a lot of the actions which are outlined within heat health action plans are, are um, actions that need to be, that need to take at the local level. So having um, local authorities involved um, is, is probably a wise uh route to go down. Um, and then, of course, you know, any warning system um, must fit within the wider um, governmental sort of functions, um, whether that's at a national level, regional level, or, or city level. So getting input from um, sort of those civil contingency um, policy um, experts within um, sort of across government, whether it's national down to local, uh, will also be key. And while, while some of the participants um, may be driving the consensus more mainly public health and, and met services, it's important that, there, that there's buy-in from across the spectrum of those involved um, and that will be expected to act on these thresholds. Um, and so, you know, Consensus is, is key, and there's lots of different methods for, for doing that, whether it's stealthy surveys, workshops, hackathons, obviously, you know, things as they are now make that a little more difficult, but uh, hopefully uh, things will start moving back where we can actually start having those face-to-face um, -face conversations and, and, and um, interactions. Um, but I think a key thing is, you know, in, in including a range of stakeholders um, provides considerations from beyond just health agencies and, and met services. And that feedback is really vital um, to ensuring that uh, any system that is developed and those thresholds that are developed are actually robust and actually acted upon. Um, and it's kind of that thing of, of building something with the end user rather than building something for the end user. In Argentina, we have implemented the heat health warning system since the summer 2017-2018. It was co-designed with the Ministry of Health. It shows a map with a color code warning and includes recommendations of the health organism. It has a daily update from the 1st of October to the end of March and has a validity of 24 hours. It is calculated for 57 locations situated in the center and north of the country. This is because in those places we have enough data to obtain climatological significant information. The south part of the country has colder climate and in the first instance it was decided not to include it in the system with the definition of heat wave that is used because it didn't have so much sense. 
So we have different thresholds for each city for maximum and minimum temperature and based on a combination of criteria it is decided the color of the alert for each one. These colors are related to the possible effect on health, where green means no effect, yellow with slight moderate effect, especially for the risk group people, orange is moderate high effect, might be very dangerous, especially for risk group people, red is high extreme effect, very dangerous, might affect all healthy people. How the thresholds were decided? They are the result of an interdisciplinary research about the relationship between mortality and heat waves in the center and north of the country. And it was found a significant increase in mortality in heat wave conditions. So which is the heat wave definition for us? A heat wave is defined when maximum and minimum temperatures are higher or equal to the percentile 90 at the same time for three consecutive days. Percentiles were calculated in the warm period of 1961-2010. Although the system is based on this definition, the criteria to decide the alert color is more complex and considers for each location a series of conditions related to the maximum and minimum temperature observed in previous days, forecast of the maximum temperature of the present day and the forecast of temperature for the next three days. In some cases it is also taken into account in the decision other thresholds like other percentiles especially for extreme or particular situations. So the UK um, heat health watch system, as I mentioned, is commissioned by Public Health England and operated by the UK Met Office. And it comprises five levels of response um, based on a threshold of maximum daytime and minimum nighttime temperatures. Um, and as you can see on the slide, these thresholds vary by region, uh, but it's about an average of um, with temperatures daytime temperatures of 30 degrees by day and 15 degrees by night um, for at least two days consecutive. Um, so I mentioned five levels. So we have level zero, which is our year round planning. Our level one is essentially our heat wave and summer preparedness program. So it um, commences from the 1st of June to the 15th of September. Um, the level two alert is issued when there is a 60% risk of reaching our threshold, um, temperature thresholds within the next two or three days. And then level three is when we actually reach those um, thresholds. And then we move into a level four, um, which is considered a major incident. And that is, um, that would be when uh, temperatures are impacting other sectors, not just the healthcare sector. Um, and moving to level four would be a uh, joint decision from across government. Um, uh, I, you know, there would be advice would be given um, from public health, from net services, um, from you know civil contingency um, organi organizations or departments, um, and and that sort of guidance given to. Um, sort of decision makers at the very top, and this would, in, in England anyway, would be driven by, um, by, by the central government and, and ministers. Um, so the thresholds in, in the English system are, are based both on the epidemiology um, of the time when this was developed and practical considerations, um, operational considerations around um, the amount of alerts that might be expected um, in, in any one year. And a broad overview of, of the process of actually um, how, how a decision is made um, to issue an alert um, comprises a number of different steps. So first of all, the Met Office will review um, the forecast. And if it looks like cri the alerting criteria are likely to be met, um, there'll be a conversation uh, between Public Health England and the Met Office. And that conversation is really a dynamic risk assessment 
um, around both the exposure, the potential impact, but then these external uh, factors. So considerations around the time of year, um, the extent of the heat, um, how long, uh, you know, the duration of the, the of the episode, and and other factors such as you know public um, events, mass gatherings, things like that. Um, so if if the decision is made um, to issue an alert, it'll then be cascaded out across across the whole system. So we're coming close to the end now, um, but I just wanted to kind of finish on on this idea that it's not just about the extremes. So in the UK, um, we have the heatwave plan independently evaluated, and that's where this chart comes from. So this essentially is um, the temperature mortality um, relationship in London, um, and we can see that the risk of mortality starts to increase at around 24 degrees. Um, below this, we have a histogram which represents the percent of days at these different temperatures. Um, and then the chart below this is the attributable fraction of heat, uh, attributable fraction of heat related mortality. Um, so this red dotted line is our alerting threshold. Um, and in London, this is 32 degrees. Um, so by the time we get to this alerting threshold, We've, the majority of the heat associated burden has actually already occurred. So in other words, if our emergency response actions were 100% effective, we would only be reducing the heat attributable burden by a very small fraction. So therefore, you know, there, this raises the question about the appropriateness of the thresholds, which is something we, which you know, Public Health England are reviewing our, our current alerting threshold at the minute. Um, but it also raises a question about um, almost over-reliance on, on just the emergency response aspect uh, of, of heat and health, um, and really kind of makes the case that we need to expand the focus from being just about emergency response, but to, to take a more strategic approach to to this issue. So, you know, for example, housing, regulations, planning, behavioral adaptation, etc. Um, we and I think this really helps us make the case that we need we need to make these actions. Um, so housing, planning, etc. Part of our business as usual, um, and actually address the kind of the low impact, high frequency temperatures before we hit our alerting thresholds. So this is the, the last slide. Um, and I just wanted to leave you with one more question, um, really. And that is, if, if setting thresholds, as, as discussed here, are, are for early warning systems, which should be triggering actions in preparation for and response to an episode of, of heat, how does this actually link in with the wider heat health action plan? So if, if a warning system is simply a tool um, that is part of an overarching plan for, for reducing heat health uh, impacts, um, you know, it, it's, it's not the only answer to the problem. So for example, you know, once we hit this threshold, that's where we take all our action. So in other words, if, if early warning system is, is to address the higher risk um, days or episodes, so these high impact, low frequency days, how, how are we addressing those other days? So the low impact, high frequency days. So, you know, is it adaptation? Is it long-term planning? Uh, is it about aligning with other strategic priorities um, at, at all different scales? Um, and I, I think this will kind of lead into uh, one of the other master classes, which is all around heat health action plans um, in general. And, and I think it's, it's just important to, to note that these early warning systems are really kind of a tool within the wider plans. So we will leave that there. Um, and I think, you know, just to summarize, partnerships are, are really key in developing heat health warning systems. 
Um, and there are a lot of different ways of working um, between organizations. And I think that, you know, the, the overall aim of, of the systems that you develop will kind of um, influence that. Um, and when it comes to setting your thresholds, you know, data availability um, will be a limiting factor. Um, but if, you know, you, you can't start with something you don't have. So it's really about using the data you have and working towards something that um, is, is, is better or is, is more useful or has, has more utility. Um, consensus among partners is, is really, really vital. Um, a shared goal and a shared objective is really uh, key for, for any of this work, not just in terms of early warning systems, but in terms of um, reducing the health burden to, to high temperatures in general, um, including the low, um, the high frequency, low impact um, temperatures. Which brings me to this last point, which, you know, it's not just about the extremes. Um, and we need to also address the lower part of that temperature mortality curve. Um, so that is the end of lecture three. Thank you.